talk about waves. So we got a fair amount to talk about with waves, but it should go pretty quick. So you got two main types of waves. Transverse and longitudinal. Transverse and longitudinal. Transverse are sometimes also called traveling waves, and they're, com they're the more common waves you think about when you think about an actual wave. So what you normally formulate in your mind as a wave, that's usually a transverse wave. So if I take a string and fix it you know, to the wall and I start wiggling the other end and you see this wave traveling on the string, that's a transverse wave. So and technically, uh, if you start looking at the waves like in a flute or something like that, those are also transverse waves. Now, a longitudinal wave on the other hand, so let's say I took a slinky. Everybody old enough to know what a slinky is? Sweet. So let's say I took that slinky. Instead of a string attached to, you know, fixed at one end, I took that slinky. And I was wiggling the slinky up and down. And it creates a wave. So, and creating that wave is still a transverse wave. However, if instead of shaking the slinky up and down, I shook the slinky back and forth. So I fix it on that wall and I start shaking it back and forth. And you'll see this wave being propagated and, you know, hits the wall and comes back and stuff. But what you see, is periods of where the spring is stretched and regions where the string is compressed alternating. And that's the wave. But it's not a transverse wave. You're not seeing this kind of, you know, nice flowing wave like you normally think of as a wave. So, and that kind of wave we call longitudinal. Now the way this actually works, so is your longitudinal wave is that your medium is displaced in the same direction that the wave is moving. So notice as I'm shaking this slinky back and forth, the wave is moving down the slinky all the way to the wall, and it might get reflected back. So, but the slinky itself, the parts of the slinky, are being displaced in that same plane. So, but if you look at your transverse wave, as I shake the slinky up and down, the slinky parts itself are displaced up and down, but the wave is moving perpendicular to that, and that's your hallmark of a transverse wave. So transverse wave, again, the displacement of the medium and the wave are perpendicular to each other. Whereas longitudinal, the displacement of the medium and the wave are in the same direction. Cool, another good example of a longitudinal wave is sound. So notice, if you put your hand up next to a speaker, what do you feel? Yeah, you feel the bass, right? But you feel what you're really feeling is air being pushed up, so against your hand, and it's being pushed. So, and as it's being pushed, the air is moving in the same direction that the wave is moving. Just kind of like the slinky example, it's also an example of a longitudinal wave. Okay, so a couple things about waves. Speed of a wave. Speed of any wave, I shouldn't say any wave, but any wave we're ever gonna talk about, is equal to the wavelength of that wave times the frequency of that wave. So you might remember this from chemistry. So you'll, you'll see this again in physics. So we might have used a different letter than F for frequency in a chemistry class. Some textbooks still use F as well. So, but for a, a light wave, when we look at light behaving in its wavelength characteristics, the wavelength of light times the frequency of light equals the speed of light. So we can apply this equation to light waves as well. So but I can apply this to sound waves, waves on a string, so waves in a flute, things of a sort. Uh, all different kinds of waves that I, I can kind of apply this lovely equation to. So kind of this universal equation. Cool, we'll take advantage of this a little bit later. So if we look at waves now. So in looking at a wave, so a little bit more complex than some of the oscillatory motion we just looked at. For the oscillatory motion we just looked at, we looked at like a spring going back and forth or a pendulum going back and forth. But now let's focus on say, you know, having that string attached to the wall on one end and then oscillating the other end back and forth and you can kind of see the wave going back and forth. So a couple things about that wave. One, we can kind of look at the equation of a wave. So at least the displacement of the medium. So, and the displacement of the medium is always changing because the string at different parts along the way are going up and down, up and down. At one moment they're a crest, maybe next moment they're a trough. So with some variation, things of a sort. And so it depends on 
the displacement, where along the string you actually are, so, and the point in time, because it's always changing. The parts of the string are actually just always moving up and down. So, and in this case, it is still oscillatory in some sense. And so if you look here, you've still got some sort of amplitude. And you can technically write this cosine or sine. I'm going to keep it as cosine. And we still got this omega t. What we're also going to find out, though, is that it also is going to depend on x, the point along the string, where we, the location of that particular piece of the string. And so a little more complex equation. It depends on time, but now I've got this other term as well. Cool. A hasn't changed its meaning. What's A called? Amplitude. Cosine function still has maximum and minimums of 1 and negative 1. And so the biggest this function could ever be is A, and the smallest it could ever be is negative A, and A is still called the amplitude. That hasn't changed. So A is still amplitude. Omega also still hasn't changed. What's omega? So angular frequency, angular frequency. And in this case, what's it equal to? Same thing it was equal to just a little bit ago. 2 pi f. So the one thing we got to deal with now is this lovely term right here, which depends on, you know, again, where on the string you actually are. So because at different points in time, one part of the string may be up here, but go a little further down, another part of the string is way down here. And so it totally depends on what point in time and where on the string you actually are. So, but from this term, this k, we can actually get the wavelength. So in this case, I did put that on your sheet. Yes, I did. Ooh, this is not actually Hooke's law at the way end. Notice Hooke's law deals with a force, whereas this, this is part of the, the term under the cosine. This is not a spring constant in this case. It's actually a different value for k. So if you notice, we use k for everything. You know why we use k for everything? To confuse you. We know you've got to pass this class to go to med school, and we don't want people to go to med school. There's too many people going to med school. So we use K for spring constants. We use K for rate constants, equilibrium constants in chemistry. We use K for Kelvin, so, and a couple of other places as well. It's really annoying. We want you to fail. That's why. So, but different K here. So in this K is related to the wavelength of the oscillatory motion of the wave. So if you look here. If I've got this wave on a string, let's say, so how would I measure a wavelength? Yeah, I might measure peak to peak. That's a wavelength. Or trough to trough. That's a wavelength. Or from any one point on the wave to the next analogous point on the wave. That's the wavelength. But the easiest is definitely peak to peak or trough to trough. That's the wavelength which we use the letter lambda. Other side of the coin is, so if I were, again, let's go wave on a string. And I'm at this end oscillating it up and down. Now let's say I create a wave, and this wave on the string now looks something like this is a terrible drawing, like this. And it's moving to the right. Well, it's going to hit this wall, and it's going to get reflected back. So, but when it gets reflected back, what you'll find is that this wave gets inverted instead. Cool. Happens every wave. So when a wave gets reflected back, it gets inverted. So that's the first part. The next part is this. Notice how I put a plus or minus here? So that tells you what direction the wave is traveling. And so here, if it's plus versus minus, so if it's minus, that means it's traveling in the positive x direction. If it's plus, it means it's traveling in the negative x direction. So it kind of seems backwards, but that's the way it works. And so when I give you an actual equation, you can look right at the sign, and you. From that one thing alone, you already know which way the wave is moving. To the right, positive x direction, or to the left, negative x direction. Cool. Notice from omega, you can still find the frequency. You can still find the period. 
cool. But from k, what additional thing can we solve from the, whatever numerical value k has? You can get the wavelength. That's the one new thing you might solve for in this case. Nothing else has changed, however, as far as some of the calculations of the things you might try and find. So you don't need any of this part of the term to get the frequency and the period. That's all going to come from omega. But k, you will use to get the wavelength. All right, so let's say we look at number 14 there. Number 14 says we have the equation of motion on a string, y equals 100 centimeters times cosine of 5t minus 3x. I will fix that on your sheet. My parentheses were just a little off. That's what they should look like. So if you notice, the equation I gave you in problem number 11 looked like that. And so the only term that's different here is this guy, this little added term here. Notice omega is still 5, amplitude is still 100. And so if I were to solve for the, excel the max acceleration or the max velocity, it wouldn't change. When I solve for the frequency, it wouldn't be any different than problem 11. Solve for the period, no different there. But the one thing I can get additionally at this time is what? The wavelength, and what's the wavelength here going to be equal to? Well, in this case, k, again, equals 2 pi over the wavelength. So the wavelength equals 2 pi over k. In this case, what's that equal to? 2 pi over 3. Cool. And that'll come out in meters for SI units. Cool. But there's one other thing. Which way is this wave moving? Cool. Because there's a negative sign, it's moving in the positive x direction. So again, when it's negative, positive x direction. When it's positive, negative x direction. It's totally backwards. It's really weird. 